We now move from partisan gerrymandering to racial gerrymandering, specifically race-based vote dilution under the Constitution and the Voting Rights Act. And there are key questions uh, to think about when we talk about race-based vote dilution. Um, to what extent should courts get involved based on the intent of the, uh, the line drawers or, or just the effects? As we'll see, the constitutional cases and the Voting Rights Act cases differ on that. And then how do we measure uh, race-based vote dilution? As you know from the partisan gerrymandering cases, the issue of partisan bias has always been seen as controversial and, and difficult to ascertain. Um, so how should we measure um, the effect of uh, racial discrimination when it comes to the redistricting process? And then third, what should the remedies be um, if we do find illegal uh, vote dilution on grounds of race, either the Equal Protection Clause or under the Voting Rights Act. Let's start with the classic case of Gamillion versus Lightfoot uh, in 1960. In that case, the city boundaries of Tuskegee were redrawn in order to excise virtually all of the African Americans from the city of Tuskegee. Uh, so you can see the, um, the, the square shape of Tuskegee before uh, the gerrymander, and then the uh, 20, uh, eight-sided uncouth figure, as it was described in the in the case itself, that uh, it became when um, the city of Tuskegee was redrawn in order to uh, take out all the African Americans or almost all the African Americans from the city. The court ruled this unconstitutional, even with Justice Frankfurter writing, um, because it was seen as a violation of the Fifteenth Amendment, that by essentially taking them outside of the city, um, the court said you were depriving African-Americans of their right to vote under the 15th Amendment. The 15th Amendment uh, prevents uh, abridgment of the right to vote on grounds of race. And so even though it wasn't like a literacy test or a poll tax or a specific law that prevented someone from voting, um, it effectively um, had that impact because it meant that people who had been voting or had the right to vote in Tuskegee elections now uh, were gerrymandered outside of the city and no longer able to vote. So if you go back uh, to the 1960s and earlier, we can see that redistricting had been used in many different ways to minimize the votes of African-Americans in particular. Here's a proposed congressional district from Mississippi in 1966, where you can see that uh, although it would be quite easy to draw a district along the Mississippi River that would have uh, represented African-Americans and would have been majority African-American, instead the proposal would slice up that community going east-west so that each one of the districts would have a, a white majority. And through the cracking of the black community and the efficient dispersion of whites uh, throughout the state, um, the, the, the line drawers would be able to, uh, to, to ensure that all of the, all of the representatives from those districts um, were white. So the history of racial vote dilution uh, under the Constitution uh, includes a series of cases that established a standard um, that, that sort of varied between focusing on intent and effects or just focusing on effects. And so there are these cases, Whitcomb versus Chavis and White versus Register, that um, established in the 1970s the early rules on how to prove uh, racial discrimination under the Equal Protection Clause when it came to vote dilution. Um, those, as we'll see, um, were supplanted by a later case called Mobile versus Bolden, which preceded um, the enactment of the 1982 Amendments to the Voting Rights Act. What emerged from those earlier cases, the pre-Mobile versus Bolden cases, though, was a standard that looked at the history of discrimination and the effect on minority political opportunity based on a totality of circumstances analysis. So you looked at um, sort of the, the voting rights situation for racial minorities in the particular jurisdiction and did these dilutive attempts through redistricting or at-large voting systems prevent them from electing their candidates of choice. And so uh, through that kind of intense historical and statistical analysis, you might then decide, all right, this, you, the court might decide that this uh, redistricting plan or this at-large election scheme uh, violated the voting rights of racial minorities. Then comes Mobile versus Bolden in 1980. Uh, in a plurality opinion there, uh, which was a, in a case challenging the at-large system of elections in Mobile for the Mobile City Commission, um, the court makes clear that the standard under the Equal Protection Clause, as it applies to redistricting, is the same as for other areas of uh, governmental uh, action. 
And so while in that case, you had three members of the Mobile City Commission, all of whom were elected by the entire population of Mobile, 35% uh, of Mobile uh, was African-American, um, but there weren't any uh, commissioners who were black. The, and so the plaintiff sued saying, look, this is uh, discriminatory. It has a discriminatory effect. We're one third of the population, and yet we can never seem to elect uh, someone to the uh, city commission. And the court says, look, that that's not um, enough in order to prove unconstitutional discrimination. The standard for equal protection, again, suspect classification prong of equal protection, is that uh, for vote dilution, you need to prove purposeful race-based vote dilution. You have to show discriminatory purpose and discriminatory effect, just like you would for employment or schools or any number of other areas. You have to show um, that the reason that this, this person has been injured was because of their race. Specifically, this is a standard from a case called Personnel Administrator versus Feeney in 1979, which actually dealt with gender discrimination and a veteran's benefit. But the standard that comes out of that for, um, for equal protection law is that discriminatory purpose implies more than just intent as volition or intent as awareness of the consequences. It implies that the decision maker selected or reaffirmed a particular cause of action, at least in part because of, not merely in spite of, its adverse effects upon an identifiable group. So even if you know that the, uh, the particular redistricting plan or the representational system is going to minimize the representation of racial minorities, the fact that you enact it does not mean it's unconstitutional. You have to have enacted it for that purpose, right? The reason that you um, enacted that redistricting plan was to discriminate. And that's a very high bar in order to jump over, to sort of get the kind of smoking gun evidence that's necessary to show that the reason that a redistricting plan was passed was in order to discriminate against a particular racial group. Mobile versus Bolden was seen as a controversial decision in part because it, it seemed to change the landscape that had been set by cases like Whitcomb versus Chavis uh, or White versus Register. And so Congress, when it was amending and reauthorizing the Voting Rights Act of 1965, then overturned Bolden to come up with an effects-based test in Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. And so the, the Congress grappled with the challenge of how do you uh, both make it a little bit easier for plaintiffs to prove racial discrimination in the redistricting process, while at the same time not guaranteeing that there are certain districts that will elect, say, Black representatives or Latino representatives. And so what they came up with is this uh, provision of law uh, uh, in the a newly amended Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. The first section, Section 2A, um, uh, had existed before and it said no voting qualification or prerequisite to voting or standard practice or procedure shall be imposed or applied by any state or political subdivision in a manner which results in a denial or abridgment of the right of any citizen of the United States to vote on account of race. And that uh, echoes or mimics uh, the words of the 15th Amendment. But what, what's new in 1982 and has been quite important in terms of regulating racial gerrymandering uh, since then is this Section 2B, which says a violation of what I just read is established if based on the totality of the circumstances, it's shown that the political processes leading to nomination or election in the state or political subdivision are not equally open to participation by members of a class of citizens protected by subsection A, basically racial or language minorities. In that, and this is the key language, they have less opportunity than other members of the electorate to participate in the political process and to elect representatives of their choice. So how might you think about this totality of the circumstances language, which is in the first line of section 2B? The court says, the extent to which members of the protected class, which is to say, say African-Americans or Latinos have been elected to office in the state or political subdivision is one circumstance which, which may be considered provided that nothing in this section establishes a right to have members of the protected class elected in numbers equal to their proportion in the population. That last uh, proviso is known as the Dole Proviso, named after Senator Robert Dole. And you can see that that Section 2 is trying to express the, the tension that I was describing earlier. On the one hand, wants to make sure that under conditions of uh, racial discrimination, that you wouldn't have to prove discriminatory purpose, but that you could show based on the totality of the circumstances that 
um, a that a redistricting plan was discriminatory. However, that doesn't mean that the uh, number of, say, African-Americans in the legislature needs to mirror the numbers of African-Americans in the population. And the, the dual proviso makes clear that that is not what Section 2, as newly amended, uh, requires. So the totality of circumstances language that is in Section 2B of the Voting Rights Act is a reference to this list of factors um, that are known as the Senate factors because uh, they come from this Senate report that accompanied uh, the Voting Rights Act. And these were borrowed from um, the, the cases I mentioned earlier, like White versus Register, which mentioned these factors, which was based off of a Fifth Circuit case called Zimmer versus McKeithen. But as you can see from um, this list of factors, it involves all kinds of inquiries as to uh, history of racial discrimination in voting, in housing and employment, education, as well as the use of sort of exacerbating factors like single shot voting uh, or party slating. All, it, it requires just an analysis of uh, the extent of racial discrimination in voting and in the electoral uh, system. Um, but even in, in, in the Senate report, it makes clear that no single uh, factor is going to be dispositive and other factors uh, might be important enough uh, such that it would be uh, an, enough to prove uh, racial discrimination cognizable under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act as amended. Given the number of factors that appeared in the Senate report and the fact that the words of Section 2 require some judicial interpretation, it was left to the Supreme Court in this famous case called Thornburg versus Jingles in 1986 to make clear the ingredients for a Section 2 vote dilution case. And so in Thornburg versus Jingles, um, the court strikes down several multi-member districts that were part of the North Carolina General Assembly's redistricting plan. And what's key about Thornburg versus Jingles is that it, it, it sort of boils down those Senate factors to three threshold factors that what are known as the Jingles prongs, even though uh, it is still true that you have to, as a Section 2 plaintiff, you've got to prove uh, the Senate factors as well. But these jingles prongs are uh, threshold conditions that you have to meet in order to um, have a legitimate claim under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. So here are the three threshold conditions. The minority group has to be large and compact enough to constitute a majority in a single member district. Second, the minority must be politically cohesive. And third, the white majority must usually vote as a block to prevent the minority from electing its candidate of choice. So now let's, let's go through each one of those uh, three jingles prongs and see how it's been operationalized, both by the court in jingles and then by subsequent cases. So first, why do we require that a minority community be large and compact enough to constitute a majority in a single member district? Well, the answer is that, look, minorities lose in a majoritarian system. Uh, and so the fact that a minority uh, happens to lose is not necessarily democracy uh, democracy failing. It could be democracy succeeding. And so uh, the fact that, that, say, a racial minority group has particular political preferences, but they're not able to win is not in and of itself a legal problem um, because the minority community has to be large enough so that uh, if you were to redistrict, if you were to draw districts in a different way than the way that the at-large system or the redistricting plan by the state has done, that then you would be able to draw a district in which they would have an equal opportunity to elect their candidates of choice. Because if a minority is, if you've only got uh, five members of a minority group in a particular jurisdiction, there's nothing you can do in a redistricting plan in order to give them the opportunity of electing their candidate of choice. Ultimately, there has to be a sufficiently large minority in order for it to elect its candidate of choice. And the court um, made clear in Holder versus Hall that you can't just sort of multiply the number of districts um, in order to, to make sure every minority is able to have a, a district in which they are the majority. That the number of representatives in the system as it exists that you are challenging is going is the benchmark against which you measure vote dilution going forward. So for example, in Mobile versus Bolden, as we discussed before, there were three members uh, that were elected at large for the Mobile City Council. And so the remedy would be that you'd have to show that at least one of those districts could be drawn with a majority minority population 
uh, so that they, the minority would be large and compact enough to have an equal opportunity to elect its candidate of choice in those districts. So what do we mean by uh, large enough? Uh, Bartlett versus Strickland, a case much later than, than Jingles, makes clear that 50% means 50%. When we said majority minority district, we meant uh, majority minority district. And so uh, the population must be over 50% of a prospective district. You can't come into to court and say, hey, we're 40% of a prospective district, but there's some people who might cross over from the white community to help us out. Uh, that's not enough. You have to show that you're over uh, 50%. Interesting, the court doesn't say 50% of what? Like, is it voting age population? Is it population? Is it citizen voting age population? Is it registered voters? They don't come out and, and, and say it precisely, but many of the lower courts have said that um, we should pay attention to the citizen voting age population. Unfortunately, citizen voting age population is not a statistic that's provided by the Census Bureau with the decennial census. You have to derive it from other census surveys like the American Community Survey. And uh, we don't have a clear pronouncement up by the Supreme Court that that's the statistics that you should use. But the, the, the logic is that the word citizen appears in Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. And so um, the, the court um, in interpreting uh, the, the, the various lower courts in interpreting it has said that 50 percent or over of uh, the citizen voting age population would need, be, need to be required as a threshold condition. But I don't want to suggest that that has been uh, an issue that's been completely settled uh, by the Supreme Court. All right, what about uh, compactness? Because it says large and compact enough to constitute a majority in a single member district. So here the rationale is that you need to be able to connect the community uh, if it is large enough together in order to draw a minority opportunity district. That if you have pockets of voters in corners of the states and the in the state, and the only way to draw them together would be to draw a very strange uh, figure going from one corner to the next, uh, that that isn't required uh, by the Voting Rights Act. And uh, as we'll learn in another lecture, this is uh, consistent with uh, another line of cases under the Constitution, sort of the wrongful districting cases are sometimes called, or the excessive use of race cases under Shaw versus Reno, uh, which also emphasizes compactness. But that's, that's a conversation for another lecture. Um, so what does it mean to be compact? Is this uh, just an artistic requirement? How do you know? And uh, the, the case Lulac versus Perry, which came out in 2006, gives us some guideposts there, because in that case, in order to prevent Section 2 liability, the state of Texas drew a district that went from Austin all the way down to the Mexico border. And, uh, and the court said that that is not what is required by uh, the Voting Rights Act. And in fact, you, by trying to um, to draw you, the state of Texas, by trying to draw that district, are not uh, vindicating the voting rights of people in southern Texas uh, who have an authentic claim uh, under Section 2. And so why it's, it's both the kind of far flung nature of that district that it was, um, you know, stretched over 300 miles that made the court say that this is not a compact a district required under the uh, first jingles prong, but also uh, that the, the Mexican-Americans who were who were put into that district were quite socially and economically different from each other. And so the state of Texas tried to replace a community which had an authentic Section 2 claim with this far-flung district that joined two very different Latino communities together. That brings up the issue of minority political cohesion, which is the second prong of jingles, and then white block voting, which is the, uh, the third prong. And so the issue here is uh, a minority community must be politically cohesive in order to have a Section 2 entitlement. And by that, we mean that they tend to vote together uh, for particular candidates. Because if the minority community is fractured and is voting for all different types of candidates, then it doesn't make a difference if you draw them into a district with each other. There is no minority candidate of choice. There is no... Uh, a set of candidates that the minority community would be behind. And so redistricting is not to blame for their lack of political success. It's the fact that they are not cohesive uh, as a political community. So how should you prove, though, either minority political cohesion or white bloc voting? Because the question here is whether you've got a minority community that's voting one way, a white community that is voting another way, and in doing so, the white community is essentially canceling out the votes of the minority community, which is unable to elect its candidates of choice.
And so there are all kinds of statistical methods to try to measure uh, and, and evaluate uh, racial block voting. We call this RPV analysis, racial polarized voting analysis, um, racial block voting analysis. And so uh, you could look at the, uh, the homogeneous precincts. For example, if, if precincts that are over 90% black are voting for one set of candidates, precincts that are over 90% white are voting for a different set of candidates, and that is routinely happening in different elections, that's one way to, to get a sense of that. It doesn't necessarily mean that um, uh, people of particular races are, are, are always voting for particular candidates, but it's, it's a way to develop an inference. Similarly, uh, you can look at uh, ecological regression techniques. You can do, for example, what, what's shown in this uh, graph, where you array along the x-axis the percent black in a precinct, and you array along the y-axis uh, the percent of the vote received by the black preferred candidate. In this case, it was Cleo Fields, who was a representative from Louisiana. And so the more that this looks like a 45 degree angle, where there's a direct relationship between the, the number of black voters or the share of black voters in a particular precinct and the share of votes that are received by the uh, minority preferred candidate, the more that you can say, ah, blacks and whites are voting for different candidates and so there is racially polarized voting. And then there are other more complicated um, um, statistical techniques such as Gary King's ecological inference model, which is now routinely used by courts. Uh, that, that also try to uh, grapple with this question of the patterns of voting by whites and minorities. Um, and, and I should emphasize that one of the difficulties here, right, is that the, 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 the ballot is secret. And so we don't actually know how people voted based on their race. Uh, so all you can do is try to make inferences from uh, aggregations of data from precincts or other uh, larger units of geography in order to assess whether um, precincts or uh, communities that tend to have large numbers of racial minorities tend to vote a particular way, whereas those that tend to be whiter vote for different candidates. So there still are open questions uh, that are often coming up in, in all kinds of litigation uh, on, on Section 2 that the Supreme Court hasn't completely resolved. Um, for example, how high must block voting be in order to warrant a remedy under Section 2? Um, the, the, the graph that I just showed with the election of Cleo Fields, that is, that is a almost perfect racial polarization, but oftentimes it's not that perfect. So how much white crossover voting, as we say, um, would be enough to defeat a Section 2 claim so that you say, well, actually, um, uh, whites are, are voting enough for the minority preferred candidate that there's no Section 2 entitlement. Um, Similarly, this question of minority political cohesion uh, uh, comes up, and the issue is, uh, you know, can you have what are known as coalitional district claims? Uh, so can African Americans and Latinos uh, bring a, a case that says, look, we are um, over 50% of a district. Uh, can uh, we together uh, have a Section 2 entitlement? That was a question that was specifically left open in Bartlett versus Strickland, which established the 50% rule, but you have many cases around the country which are being brought by coalitions of minorities. Third is, what election data are relevant in proving uh, racial block voting? So for example, you're not going to use presidential election results in order to prove racial block voting for a local school district. Uh, and so many may want to do that, for example, when it comes to um, Barack Obama's elections in uh, 2008 and 2012, use that data to then discuss racial polarization in another context, whether it's Congress, state legislature, or local bodies. Um, what you want is to be able to predict as accurately as you can the uh, rates of racial polarization for the body in question. So if it's a state legislature, um, to look at state legislative districts for county commission, county districts, in order to really predict how uh, whites and minorities vote uh, in particular elections. The problem is it's often quite difficult to get um, elections that are probative, um, where that are competitive enough, and where it's clear who the black preferred candidate is and who the white preferred candidate is, for example. And so uh, sometimes it's quite difficult to, and there's disputes over what the relevant elections are in order to eval evaluate uh, racial block voting. Many, in many situations, um, the, the plaintiffs will focus 
on elections uh, based on the candidate's race. And so you look for elections in which there, if you're, for example, an African, African-American community that is uh, bringing a Section 2 vote dilution claim, you might look at races, you might look at elections in which you have an African-American candidate in order to um, assess whether the African-American candidate of choice uh, is being voted for by the black community, um, but not the white community. Um, and, and the Supreme Court in Jingles, in a footnote, did say that those kinds of elections might be the most probative. But I want to emphasize what, what's emphasized in the Dole Proviso, that the Voting Rights Act is not about candidates, it's about voters. And so while this, these data sets about that rely on the candidate's race might be uh, instructive, ultimately the question is about the political opportunity for the voters, not a guarantee to elect a candidate of a particular race. Because sometimes you have minority opportunity districts, say majority uh, minority districts, uh, which elect white candidates uh, because the minority community uh, supports the white candidate. Uh, and so that's what the Voting Rights Act is about. It's about, um, it's about voters' rights, not about candidate rights. And then finally, what do you do in situations where party and race are highly correlated? Uh, I showed you the, the graph of racial polarization where it's quite easy to predict uh, based on the race, racial percentages in a precinct, how the black preferred candidate might do in that in those situations. Um, but suppose that uh, there's a perfect correlation between race and party, so that blacks are Democrats and whites are Republican in particular areas. Should that should that datum be relevant to the inquiry of racial polarization? Now remember that Mobile versus Bolden focused on purpose uh, in assessing whether a, a redistricting plan was unconstitutional or not under the Equal Protection Clause. And so as a general rule, Section 2 was, was sort of moving us away from looking into the minds of people to see whether racism was the, the reason behind a particular districting plan and lack of minority uh, political success. And so a party could, one, say, one might say, be irrelevant to um, the, the question in under Section 2, which looks at discriminatory effects, but you do have different different courts that have grappled with this in different way um, to look at, uh, for example, to look at primary elections or to look at nonpartisan elections to assess how much work is being done by political party as opposed to independently uh, from the race of voters in predicting minority candidate success. So a later case called Johnson versus DeGrande added what's sometimes known as the fourth prong uh, 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 for jingles. And Johnson versus DeGrande really just clarifies those, those conflicts over proportionality that I was describing before. It makes clear that Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act doesn't require proportional representation, according to the Dole Proviso, meaning that you know, if 50% of the state is black, it doesn't mean that 50% of the representatives need to be black. Uh, however, Johnson versus DeGrande does say that if you have a proportional system, meaning that the share of minority opportunity districts equals the share of the minorities in the population, that that is a factor in favor of the redistricting plan. So for example, if 50% of the state is black, 50% is white, and half the districts have black majorities in them, that that would be a factor in favor of a redistricting plan. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's not a uh, uh, another Section 2 claim that could be lodged because it's what Johnson versus DeGrande also says, you can't discriminate against voters in one part of the state by trying to draw, say, a minority district in another part of the state. And that's what Lulick versus Perry holds as well. Uh, but if you if you have achieved uh, proportionality, that that for the court would be seen as a factor in favor of the redistricting plan. So where do things stand? So there's tension between Section 2 and Shaw versus Reno, a series of cases on wrongful districting that I'll talk about in another lecture. We have a case going to the Supreme Court right now, as I'm giving this lecture called Merrill versus Milligan, which will address whether plaintiffs have a Section 2 entitlement to districts that wouldn't be drawn through a racially blind process. That's a case in which the argument is being made that um, uh, if computers are drawing millions of redistricting plans and they aren't uh, drawing additional majority minority districts, then that is not what is required under uh, Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. So there's still no Supreme Court precedent on the, the clear precedent on the population denominator to measure uh, large and compact enough under uh, Jingles 1. We've talked about citizen voting age population, but others like voting age population um, are easier to use because they're provided by the census. 
And then these questions of race and party and, and what happens when they're highly correlated are going to continue to um, be important issues in these cases. And we don't have a clear Supreme Court standard on that. But for now, um, uh, as long as there's discriminatory effect, that is what Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act is about. It's to not require uh, its plaintiffs to meet the heightened constitutional standard of showing discriminatory purpose, uh, simply discriminatory effect, um, which fulfills the jingles prongs and the Senate factors is enough to prove uh, a Section 2 violation.